Very few of us have the time or the constitution to cook and then eat a full-blown breakfast every day. Now, it's true that weekends offer the possibility of something a bit more greedy and leisurely, but anyway, why should we be constrained by the orthodox timetable? I love breakfast food, day or night. Saturdays in this house means an extra hour in bed, courtesy of a little bit of early morning cartoons, and then pancakes and muffins. Now, pancake batter needs to be made a bit in advance if you can, just because it's better if it stands. But I'm just going to preheat the oven for the muffins. Pancakes are incredibly easy, and once you get into the habit, as I have, frankly, you do it without thinking. Now, start off with two 2.5 G of plain flour. These are those thick, spongy American pancakes, um, not thin English ones. And then everything can be mixed in one bowl, which makes life easier. Some spoons, a couple of teaspoons, sort of heat teaspoons of baking powder. And they are better like this than made with self-raising flour, in case you're wondering. Teaspoon of sugar. I mean, since I'm going to be eating these with syrup, I and mean, I like maple syrup, so only a bit of sugar. And now, just two eggs and 300 ml of milk. You may find, if you make this, say, the night before, which is easy, uh, you might have to add quite a bit more milk. And anyway, with these American pancakes, these nice thick spongy ones, I always add a couple of tablespoons or so of melted butter, you know, just before frying. If, however, you want, you can just do double batch on Saturday, you've got enough Sunday. Yeah. So many options. And this whisket will get rid of any lumps. That's about done. Let's get the butter melted so it can be liquid but cooled a bit by the time the muffins are done. About two tablespoons worth. Right, put the batter aside just to rest and get on with anything else you want to do. going to turn the heat off so the butter can carry on melting in its own heat and get on with the muffins, which are savoury muffins. I'm going to start off with two to five grams of flour again, this time self-raising. Great. And 50 grams of rye flour. Now obviously that's not used in Welsh rabbit really, but it does give a sort of smoky flavour, which is lovely. That's 50 grams. And like the pancakes, this is really a kind of wet ingredients into dry job. Now, baking powder and bicarb. I know I've used self-raising flour, but I think muffins need a little bit of extra air and whoosh in them. Now this, very important ingredient, English mustard powder, a teaspoon, makes a huge difference. You want it to have a bit of bite. And I am a complete English mustard junkie. Right. Extra strong cheddar, Greek yogurt, both of which give desirable tang. And this is a very good machine for grating cheese. Not least because you can weigh your cheese out first and then grate it, rather than keep grating and weighing, grating and weighing. Right, so that's the dry ingredients. I'm just going to get my jug out for the wet ones. I want 150 grams of Greek yogurt. What you want is a bit of sourness. Six tablespoons of vegetable oil and two of Worcester sauce, one egg, and 125 ml of milk. Now just mix these together. 
And now this is incredibly easy, not least because you hardly mix, you're just stirring together because the crucial thing about muffins is a lumpy batter produces the lightest muffins. So in other words, you are being ordered to be idle. Right, just get my muffin tin out from the chaos that is my shelving system and line with muffin papers and then I'll just fill them up, stick them in the oven. Sorry. I can. Bruno, will you take these muffins to the table, darling? Good boy. Here, my love. Here you are. Bruno, sit down, please. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough, Bruno. Not mine? Now, kedgeri, which this mystery package is going to turn into, started life off in India as rice and lentils, and I think it was the English there who got rid of the lentils and added fish. For some reason, it always seemed to be smoked haddock, which I find too invasive a taste. I'm using salmon here. And all I've done is poach it for about 15 minutes in a moderately hot oven with some water, 500 mils, salt and some torn up lime leaves. Just use lime zest if that's easier. And I want to use this liquid cook the rice in. Just pour off this poaching liquid so that the flavours permeate into the rice. Now obviously you want the salmon kept warm but I wouldn't worry about putting it back in the oven. Just stick the foil on and then off to the rice in the next bit. I am now going to start off with a nice wadge of butter which I realise not maybe an authentically South East Asian flavouring but Certainly, authentically, one of my flavourings. Bit of vegetable oil just to stop it burning. And when that is fizzing and frothing a bit, just stick in this one finely chopped onion. Just cook it, just let it soften a bit. And then, the holy trinity of aromatics, ground coriander, cumin, and turmeric, which I suppose is less of an aromatic and more of a gorgeous food dye. And when all these incredibly heady perfumes have permeated the onion, just tip in, oh, this is 225 grams of rice basmati. I know it doesn't look like much, but it really does swell up. Now, we used to eat this for Sunday breakfast, but actually more just as often in the evening, kind of a nice, lovely Sunday supper, because it's so comforting. I mean, this, this version is slightly more sprightly. And then, simply the liquid. Now, this is the easiest way of cooking rice, really, whatever you're doing, which is to say the absorption method. That's very simple. You just use twice the volume of liquid to rice. So, for example, I've had the 225 grams of rice and 500 mils of liquid. Heat as low as you can, and if you've got a really fierce hob, use a heat diffuser. Clamp on a lid, and that should do in about 50 minutes, by which time all the liquid should be absorbed into the rice. Right, you see, the rice has absorbed all the liquid. It is so wonderfully yellow. Let me just have a quick taste. Perfect. Not very salty. I'm adding fish sauce later, so I don't want to, you know, be too vicious with salt now. Now just get a fork and flake the salmon, by which I mean just going to slice it into chunks of the fork and it will begin to flake itself quite big at this stage. Because now all I'm going to do is upend the whole of this rice pan. Now let me just have a little... Mm. Oh, and the, the coral of the salmon against the almost psychedelic yellow. This rice is so wonderful. Now, I have about my person three hard-boiled eggs with really glorious yolk. Just 
quartered lengthways, but it doesn't really matter. As you can see, the yolk kind of falls out of its socket. Something about things which are sort of garnished or and decorated with hard-boiled eggs, it kind of reminds me of my childhood. The fish sauce seasoning. Not too much, get too salty, just a bit. That lime juice. In some moods, I can be moved to use the zest as well, but I think I'm going to be juice only now. And a really fat bunch of pungent coriander. It's sort of wonderfully heady, this smell. So most of it on now. I'll just leave a bit again later from the top. Right, a bit more of this leisurely work. I mean, look, lovely. I might give myself a modest portion. A French historian once said that the only safe way to eat in England was by having breakfast three times a day. Well, I don't take that cruel view, but I'm ready to give it a go. This is one of my most regular solitary breakfasts, masala omelette. That's without the R, masala, not masala. That means spice. It's from Kerala and uh, it doesn't quite have the same resonance in the sunny shepherd's bush, but it's still good. Now, you can really use what you want in this. I always have a chilli, sometimes two, but I'm going to just leave the seeds in so it'll keep it nice and hot. And spring onion as finely sliced as you can muster. And on the heat, a bit of oil, not too much, it's a non-stick pan. Stick in the chilli and spring onion, just make it as hot or as modestly heated as you want. Some garlic. I have to say, if I'm kind of in a rush in the middle of the week, I tend to make this very simple and just, you know, I don't know what, a bit of chopped chilli and then some chopped fresh coriander. Right. Let's heat this through a bit to soften. Mmm, flavours come up and hit you like anything. I'm going to put a bit of ground coriander, a bit of cumin, and just a small bit of turmeric for a bit of good mood gold. So while that's bubbling away, the eggs. Pour over and just turn it like this so it just sets at the bottom and continues to set. The great chefs always used to teach their apprentices to make omelettes by making them cook on a far flame but keep this flame on so that you had to be quick because otherwise you would burn your arm a lot and that's what taught them that great skill. I, d I don't think it would be safe with me. Okay, I reckon this is enough now that's set enough at the bottom. I'm just going to show the omelette to the grill, just so the top sets as well. In and now, I want some flatbread with this. This is like wonderful. Look, it's this kind of bread tablecloth. Let's tear some off. Yeah, I'm attempting rather clumsy to turn this into an omelette shape. And this, look, and this is already lovely and puffy and gold and ready. And perhaps not authentic in. Kerala, a bit of brown sauce, and just roll up. Neat. Mmm, mm, very, very good. Breakfast, you know the saw that oozes into lunch and then into late afternoon, and if you're lucky, 
bit beyond needs liquid accompaniment. For me, that just has to be Bloody Mary. Not original, but it's, since it's the best drink, that shouldn't bother you. Yeah. Now, a friend of mine who was a barman in Hong Kong taught me the trick of adding dry sherry to Bloody Mary, and it makes a really big difference. Oh, what a generous amount. And I like my Bloody Marys hot, so I just steep vodka with some dried chilli peppers. But if you're just using ordinary vodka, use Tabasco, which you don't need me to tell you. Now, tomato juice. Been in the fridge, but it isn't really chilled. I cannot stand it cold, and I cannot have Bloody Mary with cubes of ice in. I'd rather have it, you know, room temperature, frankly. Worcester sauce and celery salt. I mean, I've always used celery salt, and I like it salty. And crucial this, a lemon, because I like Bloody Mary sharp as well as hot. And now, even though Bloody Mary is the perfect drink, I, I could see that, it doesn't actually stay as a perfect emulsion, so you need a stirring utensil. Perfect, I am now set up for a day's casual labour in the kitchen. Okay, a spot of baking, so appropriate garb. I'm making Kuchen, which in German means just means cake, but this comes from America and means a kind of sweet yeasted bread. It's half a between cake and bread with fruit on top, baked in a big slab, so it's rather like, I suppose, Danish pastry, only easier and better. Now I have in this mixer about 400 grams of strong white bread flour, 50 grams of caster sugar and half a packet of Easy Ben yeast. And in here, I have 125 mils of warm milk, two eggs, zest of about half a lemon, a bit of good vanilla extract and some ground cinnamon. So. There's no need to do this in a machine. I mean, I've got this dough hook in the mixer, so it makes life easier just for me to start it off. But in fact, I often do it by hand, and I certainly always finish it off by hand. Well, so the liquid has been kind of absorbed, and now just final enrichment, 50 grams of really soft unsalted butter, which gives it a lovely silky texture. That looks about ready now. Oh, lovely, it's quite sticky still, but then it will take up the flour as I need. So that's the idea, kneading. It's much easier for you to understand what I mean if you just watch rather than if I just prattle on. Um, which is simply you push out the dough with the heel of your hand and pull it back with your fingers. And if you keep doing that, the yeast will start activating. And what happens is you gradually feel the dough becoming more elastic. And then at the end, it suddenly seems to spring into life under your hand. It's a rather fabulous feeling. That's all coming together again. I can just feel it sort of blossoming under my hands. And really, that's the best way of doing it. Once you just need some dough once, you kind of get a feel for it. It's, 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 it's in the hands, not in the head. Put it into a buttered bowl. Just turn it once so the butter stops it from sticking all over. Cover it with cling film. After about an hour, this should have doubled in size. That's probably just the easiest way to tell. So let's go and put that somewhere warm. Look how wonderful. You can see it's risen, really doubled in size. And now, one of the best jobs in the world, punching it down. Such a glorious feeling. Wonderful. Now, a bit of pummeling, like sinking your hands into soft flesh. And that just needs to sit, to relax for a bit, just before I push it out to cover the Swiss roll tin. So that's fine. And I will get on with my egg wash. Which is just one egg, some double cream, which isn't just a splodge or so. I mean, it sounds extravagant, but it's not too bad because you will need the rest of this to eat with. A small bit of ground cinnamon, and whisk together. And I have to say, the smell 
of cinnamon wafting out of the oven is just lovely. Right. So this is really easy because although it's dough, there's no rolling out or anything, you just press it out. You just lean forward, your hands clenched, just pushing with your knuckles. And you may think you're not going to get this amount of dough to fill the entire Swiss roll tin, but you will. It's just sometimes you have to wait for a bit to let it relax again and push out or it'll spring back. See, look, beautifully filled, nice and lumpy. But that doesn't matter, I mean, this is a rough thing. Paint on the egg wash, also very satisfying. This not only tastes good, but it also stops the fruit from oozing all its liquid into the dough, because you want, you want it to not to be soggy. I mean, I like a bit of sog, but not too much. So I'm just going to leave that just to get a bit puffier and rise slightly while I get on with making the crumble. It's straightforward, and what I've got in here is 50 grams of self-raising flour, 25 grams of ground almonds, and some cinnamon. Now, it's normal to use plain flour, but I think self-raising flour makes it much better, much lighter. And all I need as well is 50 grams of really cold, good unsalted butter, just diced like this. And then all you do is rub the butter into the, these dry ingredients. And by rubbing, I just mean you're kind of pressing the, your, the fleshy parts of your thumbs against the fleshy parts of your fingers and just like fluttering. And it is a nice feel, the cool, smooth butter against the cool, smooth flour. And sooner or later, it'll look like rather fatty oatmeal. That's about it. So sugar, two tablespoonfuls of caster sugar, two of demerara for the crunch, and two tablespoons, thereabouts, of flaked almonds and just fork this through, don't use a spoon, little clump. And I know this seems like quite a lot of sugar, but you've got to remember that those apples and blackberries are quite tart, so it needs it. And now, I'm just gonna add some zest to the blackberries and brownies, scatter those on top of the dough, crumble on top, a few more almonds in the oven, that's it.